It's a wonderful privilege to be with you today, to be able to open God's Word with you this morning. Um, It is uh, a wonderful time to do that and a time that we uh, focus on Thanksgiving, which is a type of worship, you know. So when we're having Thanksgiving in our homes and so forth, uh, or we're having Thanksgiving right now, um, we are worshiping the living God. Let's uh, bow before the Lord and ask his blessing on this time in the Word. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we know that the ability to understand your Word and to profit from your Word and to grasp its full meaning is a gift of grace. And we know that it's through your Holy Spirit's work that we can know Jesus Christ by faith and that we can discern the truth of your precious Word. And we humbly ask you to turn the light on for us in this day that we can see clearly Jesus in all of his glory and see a reason for why we should be thankful people, always, always rejoicing in what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we look to you for these things as we do for everything, and we trust you for the good work that you will do upon our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's turn together to Philippians chapter 4 beginning with verse 1. Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Listen carefully. This is not the word of man. This is the word of God. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Yodia and Sinitiki to agree in the Lord, Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help those women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. All flesh is as grass, and all of its loveliness is as the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. So I thought we had Thanksgiving already. Did we not? Did you have Thanksgiving this past week? We did. So what are we doing still talking about Thanksgiving today? I thought we already had that holiday. Now it's time for Christmas, right? Everywhere you look, people are beginning to think about Christmas. And Thanksgiving is already becoming a distant memory. It's something that uh, most of the world thinks is past, that we don't really need to be thinking about Thanksgiving anymore. But uh, here, in this part of God's holy word, what we learn is that Thanksgiving is something that we just don't do once a year. Of course we don't. It's something we're to constantly be doing, constantly be rejoicing in the Lord, constantly uh, being happy in Jesus and happy to be uh, a child of God. That should fill our hearts so that it's not just a once a year holiday, in a sense, it's something that we need to be doing all the time, all, all through our day. Each and every day, Thanksgiving is something that we're supposed to do. So our pilgrim forefathers understood that, right? Uh, there's some things about the pilgrims that almost everybody knows. Almost everybody, but it's shocking how many people don't know much at all about the real history of the pilgrims in the day that we live in. But one thing that's really interesting about the pilgrims is they had a common faith very similar in some ways to the faith that you and I have today. One is they believed in the absolute sovereignty of God. They absolutely believed that God was in control of everything that happened in life so that if good things came upon them, if there were uh, times when things went exceedingly well, That was due to the kindness of God. It wasn't by accident. It wasn't by just uh, the forces of nature or something impersonal. That came about because God 
had chosen to bless them. So they believed in God's absolutely uh, sovereign right to rule over the creation so that even if the crops uh, turned out well, they would have a day of thanksgiving. If, if things went wrong, right, if there was a disaster or if there were bad things that happened, they would have days of fasting. And actually, if you look at the history of the pilgrims, they had many more days of fasting than they did of thanksgiving in those early years. But they believed in the sovereignty of God. The second thing they believed in that I think we need to keep in mind is they absolutely believed that the Bible was the infallible, inerrant word of God. They thought the Bible was, a, was uh, the blueprint of life. And the reason that they came was they wanted the opportunity to build a uh, Uh, together a community that lived on the basis of the fact that the scriptures are absolutely true. And so they sought to do that as best they could. Fallible as they were, they sought to live like the Bible was absolutely true. I just got to (laughs) say, please live like the Bible is absolutely true. Your life will be so much better for eternity, right? We know that that's how what we know of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know based on Scripture, right? So Scripture is absolutely so important. But how to live our life skillfully, how to live our life well in this day and age that we live in. We go to the Scriptures and we live like the Scriptures are true. That's what the pilgrims tried to do. And that's what we all ought to do if we... No, that God is real and that, the, that he's spoken to us, that he's given us an infallible word, a word that, yes, there are parts of it that is hard to understand. That's true. But it's plain enough, right? It's plain enough that anyone who earnestly, under, under his blessing, under his empowering, any of us can understand enough to know that we should live our life under the dominion of the Lord who's sovereign and who's spoken and given us a word. And here's another thing I want you to remember about the pilgrims that you don't hear many times, is they believed that living life was a covenant arrangement, right? They believed this whole concept that God was sovereign and he sent his son and the whole understanding of scripture centered around covenant understanding. So God was a covenant-keeping God. That's why his word is trustworthy, because what he says he will do in his word, he will absolutely do. And we can, that's what the pilgrim's way of life was about. And days of thanksgiving were about that, because they felt that they were in covenant with God. They were in this bond through Jesus Christ with God, and that their life, in a sense... I want to put it this way. Some, you know, there's a, there we could go deeper. We don't have time for that. But in a sense, we're living our life in sort of a cooperative, if you want to put it that way, with living God, Jesus, ruling over us. And we're listening to his word and seeking to walk in the light of his truth because that's the way of blessing. And when you're in the wilderness, right, and, and people are dying because of the harsh conditions of life, They did not give up on this idea that God was absolutely sovereign, that his word was absolutely true, and that life should be lived in this covenant relationship with God. And so they had these days of thanksgiving. And here, in this part of God's holy word, the apostle is telling us that rejoicing and thanksgiving is the way that we are to live our lives all the time, right? Yes, it's fine to have a day of thanksgiving, right? It's fine to do that. But being happy in Jesus, (laughs) you can't rejoice if you're not glad. And you can't be glad in the Lord if you don't understand the greatness of his grace to us. And how wonderful it is that our sins are forgiven, that God is our God, that he is there for us, and he has sent his son Jesus to die on a cross to take away our sins. 
and that our whole life is different because of that. That's why we can live our life rejoicing always. That's what he's saying here in this part of God's holy word. He wants us to practice thanksgiving and rejoicing. He wants us to practice thanksgiving and rejoicing. He wants us to constantly be thanksgiving and rejoicing because that is the way of blessing. And that's how we overcome. We overcome the problems of life through centering our life in the joy of the Lord and in the joy of knowing Jesus Christ and in rejoicing together with the Lord on that. So Paul was arrested in Philippi. You remember, this is Philippians. He was arrested in Philippi. He had uh, gone there because that was where the Lord had directed him to go. And you remember the story. God uh, used him to cast out a demon out of a, a, a girl who uh, for, did fortune telling. And he ended up in jail. He and uh, Barnabas were whipped and put in stocks. And in the middle of the night... The Philippian jailer, remember, heard the sound of them rejoicing and singing and worshiping God at midnight. Now, let me ask you, how many of you have been worshiping God at midnight recently? <laughs> well, it's been a long time since I really have, uh, if, I, if I can even think of a time when in the middle of the night, I would uh, be uh, rejoicing and singing hymns. But how many of us have been in stocks and after being beaten and arrested, would we do that? An amazing thing. An amazing thing. And look what God did in response to that. And it's no wonder that in the book of Philippians, we find the apostle talking about joy and rejoicing more in this book than any other book because that was the background of how he began to work, how God worked through Paul to see this church come to root. So first thing here in our text, when we look at verse 4, we are instructed to practice rejoicing and thanksgiving. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So here's a command. In the Greek, it's clear it's a command, right? It's a command. It's an imperative, and it's a present tense. So it's like continuously be rejoicing in the Lord. And again, just in case there was no mistake here that you thought I was just kind of brushing through this too quickly, I'm saying do it again because it's so important to our Christian life to constantly be rejoicing. Now, how can we do that? We can only do that in the Lord, in the Lord, in relation to Jesus, right? Because we are in a covenant relationship with Jesus. We're in a union with Christ, in Christ Jesus. We can do that as we we are in this sweet fellowship with Jesus Christ. Then rejoicing becomes something, yes, it's a command to practice. Yes, it's something we're supposed to be doing. But it becomes an outworking of our relationship to the living Lord Jesus Christ that we're living and sharing and going through our life sharing our life with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that changes everything. So the world cannot take that away from you and I, if you know him by faith. Can never take it away from us, right? The the world cannot understand it, right? The world does not understand it. It struggles to understand it. The world doesn't understand where we came from. The world doesn't understand where we are, and the world doesn't understand where we're going. But you know where you're from if you're a person who knows Jesus Christ by faith, if you're a person who knows that the God's holy word is absolutely true. You know where you came from. You know where you are in the the pilgrimage of life, right? Right? You know that we are to live to the glory of God. You know that we're to live in this relationship to Jesus Christ. And you know where we're going. We're on our way to a beautiful heavenly kingdom. 
that's real. It's just as real as this place we're in today. And just as surely as you're hearing my voice today and you're seeing my face right now, there's going to be a day when you're going to see Jesus if you know him by faith. You're going to see him, you're going to hear him, you're going to know him, and you're going to be with him in glory. That's what the Bible says. And so that changes how we look at everything. And in a sense, that's enough, isn't it? <laughs> Who needs more than that? You know, If we can't get happy about that in our hearts, if we can't be glad about that in our lives, then what will it take for us to be happy? A lot more stuff, a lot more of what the world has to offer, a lot more entertainment, a lot more things. No. We have everything we need in the Lord Jesus Christ, ultimately. The pilgrims had very little, for instance, but they were glad in the Lord. And you and I can be glad in the Lord. You know, I used to have two dogs, and I miss them, but uh, kind of good, kind of glad they're gone in a way. <laughs> they had their time, right? They, you know, I'm a dog person, but you know, in these days, I've decided not so much. So one was a big dog, right? A big old basset hound, you know, stupid looking, got these big ears that drag everywhere, and he was the most obnoxious kind of a creature, really. He just was had a bad attitude about everything. The other one was a, it was a little pug, right? Probably a third of his size, right? And he was just kind of the opposite. He just seemed to be, you know, just a lovey kind of pet. So one time we went out and we bought him uh, two big old bones, right? Exactly identical. Exactly identical. And we gave the bones to both of them, right? So the big dog took his bone, began to chew on it like dogs do with his floppy old ears and everything kind of drooping around it, looking at it. And you don't mess with him when he's chewing on his bone, right? And the little dog, he couldn't even hardly get the bone in his mouth, but he began to chew on his too, right? And the big dog looks over at the little dog's bone, and he begins, you could see the wheels turning in his little, his head. Hmm. And you know what he did? He left his bone, went over there, and stole the little dog's bone. (laughs) And he carried it back over to where his big bone was, and now he had two bones. And the little dog's standing there looking at him, kind of with his head to the side. And uh, so, you know, I think that that big dog mentality is around, We can't be content with our life. Sometimes we struggle with that. What God has given us, is it not really enough if he's given us the necessities of life and he's faithfully given us and he's given us warm homes to live in and he's given us this? How much more stuff do we need? We're like the big dog so many times that need more and more and we never find it. But Jesus is enough. The cure for so much is to be found in rejoicing in Jesus Christ alone. And the cure is to see that what we have in Jesus, because we know where we've come from, we know where we are if we know him by faith, and we certainly know where we're going. It changes the whole way we look at life and the way that we value life. Secondly, he says about this thing of practicing, he says, He says that we're supposed to practice it always, but practicing rejoicing and thanksgiving will change our outward and inward worlds, verses 5 and 6. Here he says, you know, that we need to let our reasonableness be known to all people. Reasonableness, gentleness, moderation. That means, uh, you know, a kind of attitude toward others and toward life that is is not demanding and self-willed and covetous, always wanting more than we really have. We should be learning to be content with our lot, learning to uh, have a kind of moderate attitude toward other people. 
You know, any two people that sit down and talk for 15 minutes are going to find out that they're quite different in how they view everything or to view a lot of things in life at least. But a Christian ought to have an ability to get along with all kinds of people. Honestly, I'm, I'm not just saying this. I've got a lot to grow <laughs> in this. But I want to be that guy that anybody who wants to sit down and talk to me, no matter how different they are from me, can find a kind heart, at least. Doesn't mean I'm going to agree with everything that they do. Doesn't mean I'm going to say everything's okay. But I'm going, I want to be that person that is gracious to all people. And that's the way we should be in our lives, in our relationships with other reasonableness. So outwardly, there should be this reasonableness, right, that changes uh, how we act around people. It comes out of being thankful and rejoicing because we can be that way because we have Jesus. And we can, we can be extremely uh, kind because we've been kind. Jesus has been gracious to us. So we should be gracious to others. So, you know, I've said this several times recently, but I'm going to say it again. So last week, the office I work for was sending around a paper saying, we're going to have a Thanksgiving dinner, right? And, and uh, you know, uh, we need you to sign up for something. So by the time I got the thing, <laughs> every single thing was accounted for, right? Nothing else I was scratching my head, well, what am I supposed to do? And it was clear we were having this big meeting, and uh, everybody was waiting. Okay, you're the last one. So I signed up for turkey and dressing. Turkey and dressing, yeah. (laughs) So I texted my wife, and I said, you know what? (laughs) We're going to get turkey and dressing for the office. And she writes me back, what? (laughs) So... um, you know, she knew as well as I did that I would help, but, you know, it's going to basically be her task because she's the cook. <laughs> so, you know what? She, when I saw her, she asked me about it. This is the truth. She asked me about it. You could tell she was a little bit perturbed with me about it, but she never said another bad thing about it. And she did it, and she did a beautiful job with it, she fixed it up so that all I had to do basically was walk into the office with all this food. And, and I just, I'm just saying, I'm not trying to, I mean, that's what I mean. Moderate, <laughs> kind. I wish I could be that way all the time. Uh, God, please don't put me to the test like I did my wife. But, you know, that's what we should be, kind. And then he goes on and he says this. He says, you know, about our Um, internal world. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests be made known to them. It's interesting, the word anxious in Greek, I'm just going to say quickly, it literally means to be pulled in different directions. And that's what anxiety does. It just fragments us into pieces. Don't be torn to pieces about things. He says, learn to pray. Learn to pray and trust God and learn to go to God with all of your cares and learn to do it with thanksgiving because if you do that, then things will tend to work out very much differently and so much better. So we learn to trust God in our heart and we learn to go to God in prayer and to pour out our uh, concerns before him because that is the way that we will find real relief. Not just psychological relief, right? Not just feeling better inside. Although, yes, indeed, nobody is going to ever come up with any other way to help people to deal with anxiety better, quote me on this, than prayer. All you've got to do is look at the human race (laughs) through centuries and centuries and recorded time. Prayer Turning to God and trusting him is the best antidote for anxiety that we can find. So that is what we are to do if we are to have peace within. You know, Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. 
Is not your life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither uh, sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more value than they? Someone wrote this little poem, When the birds begin to worry, and the lilies toll and spin, and God's creatures are all anxious, then also may I begin. For my Father set their table, decks them out in garments fine, and if he supplies their living, will he not provide for mine? If his children's hairs are numbered, why should we be filled with fear? He has promised all that is needful and in trouble to be near. So cast all your care on him, for he cares for you. Lastly and quickly is practicing. Practicing thanksgiving and rejoicing leads to peace. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So there's a peace that doesn't rest upon reason. There's a peace that doesn't rest upon how things look reasonably. There's a, there's a peace that comes from being in constant communion and fellowship with the living God through Jesus Christ. And this peace will guard us. And it's interesting that the word guard here literally means to stand watch like a sentry. And it's interesting. So we don't have to be on guard like that as much because this peace that God gives us will keep our minds from spinning out into anxiety and to uh, being too wrapped up in the cares of this life. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So peace, you know, shalom, everything in its place. Everything is set like it ought to be. And in the sovereign God ruling our life through his son, Jesus Christ, knowing that he has ordained everything that happens in this world and ultimately for our good, knowing that we stand forgiven through grace, through, through trusting in Jesus Christ, through faith in him, we know that we're forgiven. We can stand in this world in a different way. So practice, listen, if you don't remember anything else, Practice thanksgiving. Practice rejoicing. And I would submit to you that the more we practice, the more that we learn to give thanks and to count our blessings, you know, as the song says, the more that we will enjoy peace and we'll enjoy stable relationships and we'll enjoy an abundance with what God has given us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you that it is absolutely true and trustworthy. We thank you for Jesus, and we rejoice in what we have in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Father, please teach us to walk in rejoicing and thanksgiving, practicing that as an article of our faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.